Hello and welcome back to the CEO.ca coverage live from the conference floor at PDAC 2024. My name is James Patton and today I'm joined by four Uranium CEOs, Corey Bielik of Canalask Uranium, John Cash of UR Energy, John Bay of Standard Uranium and Drew Zimmerman of Stallion Uranium. Gentlemen, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. So I wonder if we could start with uh, you know, some introductions, maybe a little bit about your backgrounds uh, and the companies that you're working with. So maybe, Drew, if you could kick us off. Absolutely. Uh, Drew Zimmerman, CEO of Stallion, as you mentioned up the top. We're a junior explorer in the Southwest Basin, the largest land package in that area, uh, next to the development projects of Next Gen and Fission Uranium, uh, with a drill that's about to start turning, looking to make that next significant discovery in the basin. Perfect. Uh, my name is John Bay. I'm the CEO of Standard Uranium. We are a Canadian junior uranium exploration company focused in the Athabasca Basin of Saskatchewan. We are an exploration company mixed with the project generator. We have 11 projects. We have four of our projects under agreement with Earn and Partners, which we just signed for $31 million over the next three years. So we're very busy. We just started our first drill program a week ago, and we're going to be drilling continually until the end of October. So lots of uh, excitement to come from our Standard Uranium team. And I'm John Cash. I'm CEO of UR Energy. We're a publicly traded company on the TSX in the New York American. Uh, we've been mining uranium now for a little over 10 years uh, in the Great Divide Basin of Wyoming. I've got about 13 rigs turning right now as we ramp up production uh, to supply into some really good long-term contracts. My name is Corey Bielek. I'm president and CEO for Kanalaska Uranium. We're a project generator and, and active explorer in Canada's Athabasca Basin, the Saudi Arabia of uranium. We have over 500,000 hectares of land in the eastern Athabasca Basin and around all that critical infrastructure of Cameco and Rhinos. And we just recently announced an intercept of super high grade mineralization, 17 meters of 14% uranium near MacArthur River on our West MacArthur JV with Cameco. So gentlemen, uranium, talk of the town this year. You know, since PDAC 2023, you know, we've seen approximately uh, you know, spot price doubling in that time. Uh, you know, how has that last year been for you? Uh, and your, your respective companies. Corey, maybe if you want to start this off. Yeah, it's been an incredible, uh, incredible year and things have really picked up pace in, in the uranium space. And what that means for us is that we can gain the capital to actually go out and explore these projects and go out and make these discoveries. So, you know, having a sentiment return to the space after, you know, better than a decade of, of doldrums um, is really nice to see and it's benefiting all parties that are active in the uranium space. And certainly it's affected us in a very positive way as well. You know, we've been doing a lot of hiring. We've got 65 people now at our Lost Creek site. And I think we'll, we're likely to make a decision to ramp up production at our Shirley Basin mine as well here uh, before too long. But that's all based on the uranium price, as you mentioned, uh, is, you know, doubled in the last year. And uh, we've been able to sign some really good high-priced long-term contracts with utilities that uh, are going to lock in revenues for many years to come. So certainly has been transformational uh, for the company. Okay, incredible. And, and for you, gentlemen? Yeah, I'd say the uh, sentiment PDAC 2024 uranium is definitely the talk of the town. Uh, since WNA in September, the spot price has gone from $55 up to over $105 and settling around $95 right now, but uranium is hot. It's a sector everybody wants to be in. In the Athabasca Basin, you know, we see new uranium companies popping up every week. Everyone wants to be there and they want a piece of that land, but what's important for us and what we're seeing is you've got to have all these things laid out. You've got to have a good land package. You've got the team to do it. You've got to have First Nations agreements and permits. And a company like Standard Uranium, we've got all those things. So for us, you know, it's a remarkable time of year to have all our projects uh, getting worked and five drill programs in 2024. So remarkable year 2024 is for us. Similar uh, sentiment, obviously, in the last year. I mean, we started with a very big greenfield land package and, and with the sentiment uh, as hot it is as it is with uranium and, and the understanding that we need significantly more uranium deposits to be found in the, in the coming couple of years, let alone the next couple mm -hmm. of decades. So to have a uh, project scale like we have and to be able to advance it and be able to finance it uh, is what the sentiment's done for Stallion Uranium, taking large greenfield projects, bringing them all the way up to drill readiness and having multiple shots on that. We're gonna have multiple tier one target opportunities in the Southwest Basin. And again, the sentiment just allows us to get all that work done. Yeah, so I, I wanna start off with something you, you touched on there. So you're looking at demand for uranium uh, at COP28, I believe, Canada was one of 22 nations committed to tripling uh, the amount of nuclear power in their energy mix by 2050. 
uh, obviously you know these are significant commitments uh, but you know, what is the the real pathway to achieving that you know often these kind of landmark uh, statements are maybe not backed up fully with uh, with you know uh, full production plans but you know as uh, you know, uranium explorers and, and producers. You know, what's your perspective on this? You know, what is the pathway and are, are there any major uh, obstacles to achieving it? Yeah, it's an aspirational goal. Uh, will they hit that? Maybe we'll see, but there are a lot of uh, barriers in the way, uh, both for, for building out the reactors globally, of course, that'll be a challenge, but we're well on our way. Uh, China certainly is uh, leading the charge on that, but a lot of other countries are following close behind. But we have to fuel those reactors as well, and that's going to be a big challenge, and that's going to be up to uh, us gentlemen on the stage and, and others to be able to do that. And uh, the, there are a lot of challenges there. Already the miners are not keeping up with demand, and as more reactors come online, the miners are going to have to pick up the pace, and uh, that's our target across the industry is to pick up the pace, get the funding, get the miners, get the technology, and uh, you know, really get in there and get after it. So a lot of challenges uh, to be able to fill that supply chain gap, but I think we're up to the task. Anyone else see any other major kind of threats to this adoption? You know, is this uh, landmark kind of statement going to be achieved? Well, I'll, I'll jump in here. I mean, it's great to see companies getting behind it and great to see at these global events, many nations understanding the fact that we need nuclear power to hit those goals. Uh, you know, going back a few years, it was people thought it was going to be wind and solar were going to get us there. And Germany's done a great job of proving that's not going to happen. So we have to bring nuclear on. And we're seeing countries like China really driving in demand with, you know, 10 reactors being built every year for the next 10 to 15 years. And other countries are saying the same thing. They want to get back in the game. They want to build nuclear, new nuclear, the big reactors and also the small modular reactors, which many forecasts don't even include those yet. So, look, there's a lot of work to be done to get to that level. We're really happy to see the world getting behind clean energy and nuclear being a big part of that. Now it's up for us, up to us as exploration companies to have the funding to come in and let us do what we do and let's go find the next, uh, the next uranium discoveries and build mines. Mm -hmm. And James, you know, if I might add, the, the SMRs is a critical point in my view because this is a game changer. You know, this is something that two years ago was talked about as sort of fantasy and timelines weren't really all that distinct. And now step forward two years to present, and this is this is happening. It's happening on a global scale, and it's happening, for instance, in Canada. When you know a small city like Saskatoon is going to have a micro reactor in place, providing clean energy for a city like Saskatoon, traditionally a market that can't be accessed by the nuclear industry. It's been looked at many times, and this is just one example. And John touched on it, whereby it's not even factored into demand yet because they don't know how to actually assess that. So that just adds to what is already a very large gap moving forward between supply and demand. And uh, it's just an incredible scenario that, you know, in my 30 years in this industry, I've never seen these fundamentals as strong as they are and rock solid. And, you know, and just in the SMR world, imagine when countries like China or, or the US or others that start making this en masse, it becomes like Lego blocks. You know, how many Lego blocks do you need put in? You sequence them and off it goes. And as, as you pointed out, it's gonna need fuel. You're going to need fuel for those reactors. More discoveries are going to have to be made. There's a lot of uranium out there. In order to access it, you have to increase that price substantially to actually incentivize that production to come on stream. So it's just a, a fantastic scenario that's coming on, coming on here. Yeah, it's a really interesting uh, technological development with you know the increasingly widespread adoption of these SMRs. Uh, I guess you you, you touch on on the supply, and and that's something that is of, of most interest to everyone on this stage. Uh, you know, there's been talk of maybe some of the uh, you know, weighty producers, Kazatomprom, maybe having the ability to ramp up production and you know, flood the market in response to uh, these high prices and, and maybe bring them back down to earth a little bit. What are, what are our thoughts around that? You know, do we think that any, any companies have the ability right now to actually do that? Or are the fundamentals going to keep uranium prices you know, at the levels we're seeing today? So we just had you know, earnings reports from both the two largest producers in the world, Chemical and Kazataprom, and guess what? They missed. They can't hit the, mark, the numbers they're projecting to hit. So that's it's not unusual, and it's not something that uh, many in the industry were surprised by. But going forward, look, as much as they'd like to keep on producing, you just can't do it. It's, it's difficult. Um, hitting those numbers are, it's going to be tough for them to do. So there's not going to be, and there's no producer in the world that's going to step up and be able to flood the market. It's just not going to happen. And I think some of my peers could comment on that as well. You know, we're ramping up production right now at our Lost Creek mine, and I can tell you the last year has been filled with challenges, with supply chain issues. They are very real. Uh, manpower, getting enough manpower, but not only enough manpower, skilled labor. 
uh, is in very short supply. So uh, that's not unique to us. Uh, we're hearing the same thing from around the world. And so to be able to ramp up mines anywhere in the U.S., Kazakhstan, Canada, it's a significant challenge that the industry faces. And so, yeah, I agree with John. It's going to be very difficult for anyone to, to jump in and flood the market. A lot of those deposits that have been tier one in the past, they're going to continue to be tier one, but all miners start at the best part of the deposit. So we're not expecting those deposits to get better with time. The, you know, they're getting old and long of tooth and the quality is going to go down, not up. And the time is a bit of the problem here in that you know, we're yeah. talking about near-term challenges, but if you step forward you know, to 10, 15 years down the track, you start thinking about some of these traditional tier one assets, whether it's in Kazakhstan or in, in the Eastern Athabasca Basin, in Cigar Lake and MacArthur River, you're talking about reserve depletion. And those reserves are finite. And I think if you look into Cameco's documents from their meetings that John referenced uh, not too long ago, you'll see a couple lines in there, one around Cigar Lake. And that asset now has a definitive life of about 13 years, and that's it. Then you go to MacArthur River and they're taking it from 19 to 25. Whether they can do that or not, we'll see. The point is they're gonna speed it up. And all that's gonna do is take it from about 18 years of reserve life down to maybe 13 as well. So you've got a fundamental problem in two of the three tier one jurisdictions currently producing uranium, 20% of global production, being offline in just over a decade. That's a significant challenge to think about moving forward as this continues to build out. Yeah. And so, you know, with maybe the depreciation of, of these tier one assets and, and, you know, some more finite mine lives coming into play, uh, you know, where do we see, you know, the next cigar lakes, the next uh, Cameco deposits, you know, where, where is the, the future supply of uranium going to come from? I think for us, you know, we're incredibly excited about the Southwest Basin. I mean, when you look at the history of what's happened in the basin, it started up north, Uranium City in the 1950s, came down into the east side of the basin through the 70s and 80s. And we think the Southwest is, is now where the Eastern side of the basin was in, in the mid eighties. You know, that next wave of uh, exploration is happening. We're taking it into what we're calling the new frontier, a little bit more depth, but again, the potential to find that significant deposit, that cigar lake, that MacArthur River, you know, something that actually moves the needle on a global scale to be able to find several hundred million pounds makes a difference and can be a significant discovery. And Again, you need to be going out in areas where people haven't been doing that work, and that's been Stallion's strategy from the beginning, is not to be operating in an area where you can't have these deposits. Everything tells us it could be there. That work just hasn't been done, and we're doing it with the best technology that's available these days to go out there and see if we can't make that happen, giving ourselves the very best probability because we need it. We need it on a global scale to have that kind of discovery. Yeah, you have to, yeah, in support of that Southwest Athabasca base, it will be a new production center. So things like that will come on behind Cigar Lake or even toward the end of it or MacArthur River, for instance, that will help. But you still need in a growing demand world, you're going to need new tier one assets or very good tier twos to actually come and be discovered and be put into that pipeline that feeds the infrastructure in the Southwest and in Drew's case out, out in that jurisdiction. These deeper terrains that have never been explored for will have large deposits discovered. It's just never been explored for because we've had the easy ones. Now it's getting a little more challenging. Some challenges will have to be overcome, but new discoveries will be made in areas that traditionally haven't, uh, haven't been explored. And you know, that's some of our focus here is on this panel is to go out and look in those areas and um, success will come. And I uh, fully agree with both with both Drew and Corey. The southwest corner of the Athabasca Basin is ripe for great discoveries. In the last 10 years, we've had uh, Fission discover Triple R there, and then NextGen's got their aero deposit, which is going to be Canada's next mine and mill built in the southwest corner. And then last year, F3 made a discovery just north of that. And for us, our flagship Davidson River project is tucked right in that same region. So uh, we're going to keep exploring heavily. We're fully confident that there's going to be another bigger discovery Potentially one of these companies on stage here can make it and we want to be part of that. Uh, the Southwest Corner is super exciting and we can't wait to get drills turning there again this summer. So I want to touch on that a little bit more because we're seeing some interesting dynamics at play right now. You know, with spot price, uh, you know, around 95, you know, increased massively over the last year. If we look at the largest uranium ETF, uh, Eura has 66 uranium holdings, uh, which Can Alaska and Eura Energy are, are two of them. If we break down those holdings and we look at the sub $50 million market cap explorers, the average gain of those companies over the last year is actually negative 0.4%, so flat essentially. 
over 50 million, 21%, and then the average producer gain, 52%. So we're seeing you know, these producers are uh, you know, benefiting from the higher commodity prices, but the kind of further down the value chain you get to the explorers, you know, we're not really seeing these valuations reflecting the higher commodity prices yet. So I want to know, you know, what are your thoughts on, on these kind of diverging dynamics and what needs to happen for value to be realized, you know, across the whole uh, sector? Well, it's critical for the, uh, the juniors that are exploring to be able to get that market exposure, run that share price up so they can have the money to run the exploration programs. You know, going back to the previous question, kind of melding it with this, there's been so little exploration over the last 10, 15 years because the price was so depressed. So we need to backfill that supply. It takes money to do that exploration. So that's gonna to have to, to break that cycle because they need the funding to be able to go out and explore and make discoveries. Otherwise, that supply gap is gonna get larger and larger. So that is gonna to have to break at some point. And I believe it will break because the, at, to your point, producers or near-term producers have moved significantly on pace with each other and on pace with the price, um, you know, like your energy. And, and the others have lagged, as you pointed out. But if you look back to 2006, the last real cycle that we can mostly remember, um, it's identical. You basically shape yourself up in the exact same fashion where producers all form that nice growth. We languish you know, on, on the downside here in the junior space, and then it snaps. And in literally one quarter, that inverts, and the juniors take off, and all that sort of capital that went into the safe assets or the safe jurisdictions or whatever it might be in the production side of the equation starts to flow into the higher risk capital in the junior space that ultimately goes and drives those discoveries. So this is shaping up identical to the last cycle. The difference is, as we're talking about today, those fundamentals are rock solid. We didn't have that 15 years ago. It's present today. And that's a significant difference today from 15 years prior in the last sort of very short lived and I'll add to Corey's point there. I mean, when that turns, we're gonna see a lot of junior explorers, the sub 50 market cap start to move up, but at the same time, not every company is gonna move up. So when I talk to investors about this, I always caution them. When you're looking for junior explorers, look for companies that have got some good, good things going for them. Do they have a team that's actually done exploration in uranium in Saskatchewan? Do they have projects that have value? Do they have relationships with First Nations or with the government to get their permits? Do they have the workforce? Do they have the drill companies, the vendors? Those are all crucial. So I caution people, don't just look for somebody with a, a flag planted in Saskatchewan. Look for these other things they can tick on those boxes because those companies that are actually running drill programs, those are the ones that have the real home run potential as well. Yeah, I think just adding to, to what Corey was saying and what I like to, to say is it's, it's all about confidence. And I think that's where we're starting to see such a good fundamental backdrop. And especially with Kazata Prom at the beginning of this year, not you know being able to just open the tap, so to speak, as, as the bearish case, we're seeing the fundamental confidence come into the market over the next couple of years to next decade. And that allows people to start moving out the risk spectrum. And, and the junior companies, you know, the simple analogy is, is that beach ball underwater? You know, when you don't have the confidence, it gets held underwater, held underwater as the mid tiers and the producers start to do a lot better. But when you come and you have confidence and that beach ball, you know, you let go of it, they can really take off and, and it changes in a big way. And I think a very important part of this, I mean, there's three, you know, relatively small uranium companies on the stage right now. It is not a big sector you have a little bit of money starting to flow into it and prices will start to change dramatically and very, very quickly. Uh, and I think that's something that's going to be important as uranium becomes such a, a pivotal energy source over the next couple of decades, you know, the size of our market is going to grow from, you know, 50 billion overall to several hundred billion in my mind, because yeah. you just have to have that level of investment come into something that's going to be so critical for a cleaner future for the whole world. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's going to be an exciting time. I think, you know, things are setting up, as Corey said, to have this year be a very, very exciting year for the junior space. Not to rain on the parade here, but two years ago, you know, we were talking about a different uh, clean energy metal. Lithium was the talk of the town at PDAC, and we saw some spectacular movements uh, and then some spectacular movements right back down. What are the fundamentals this time that support you know, the bullish case for uranium in a long-term basis? I'll kick that off. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. In the U.S., we still have the largest fleet of reactors in the world. 
those 94 reactors were all slated to be shutting down over the next 10 to 20 years. But as a result of that Inflation Reduction Act, every one of them now is staying online. They're looking at power upgrades. Uh, they're looking at running longer and generating as much power as they possibly can. So that has essentially reversed the uh, demand going forward from uh, slowly uh, shutting down in the U.S. to staying in place and growing. So this is a, a, an advanced industry. It's been in place for a very long time, and we're seeing growth and uh, sustaining uh, existing reactors, not just in the U.S., but around the world. So I think it's a little bit different in that regard from the lithium space. This is a, a very old industry with a lot of a new demand coming online. So I think that uh, is a big difference between the two, and I think the price is sustainable going forward. Um, it's a complicated issue because we're throwing in a lot of geopolitics on top of it. But if you just look at the basic supply demand fundamentals, it's a growth industry. I'll, I'll jump in real quick on that as well. I think you know what we see mapped out in supply demand is, is governments. And as we said earlier with COP28, you're seeing governments all going the direction of, of more nuclear, uh, with, except for Germany right now, but we'll see in a couple of months when they go to election. But I think the other important piece is gonna be you know, big companies that are incredibly well capitalized. You know, the, the Magnificent Seven, everybody's heard so much about over the last year as they've done incredibly well. But especially when you look at a company like NVIDIA and the number of chips that are getting made for new AI technologies and these data centers that are coming into play, you know, these companies operate at a very high social license as well and want to be carbon free. So I think if you have, you know, companies with billions and billions of dollars of cash, you know, not waiting around for the government to move things forward, but start putting their own money behind clean power and SMR technology to work on these data centers is, yep. you know, to use a Canadian term, a way to see demand hockey stick. You know, it's not in any of the supply demand formulas right now or any of that forecasting. So, you know, it's, it's incredibly robust as it is, but the potential that that brings in, and again, taking some of the government bureaucracy out of it and really moving things forward on a private side moves things faster it could be an incredibly exciting catalyst. Yeah, so you, we, we've touched on the geopolitical aspect of it a bit. Obviously, uh, you know, some thorny issues, the kind of dirty little secret of, of the US continuing to import Russian uranium. Uh, looking at Canada, you know, Athabasca Basin, what role should Canada be playing in the global uranium sector? Well, first and foremost is fuel supply. You know, we are one of the biggest uh, jurisdictions for fuel supply. Uh, the raw fuel, but also conversion, getting into those those power plants, spe specifically in the U.S. So that's going to be a huge role. And I think one thing we heard from the WNA in 2023 is that uh, the U.S. is actually looking to Canada to help them cut the red tape in the SMR space, because we're doing it here in planned six years, taking it from decision right through to first power in six years, whether it's in Ontario or in Saskatoon, as we discussed earlier. And uh, when you have a U.S. senator up on stage in London saying, we've turned to the, to the Canadian market, the regulators, to help us cut our red tape to do the same thing in the U.S., I think that is an incredible role that Canada can play because that will only spread on a global scale, a global scale to help get this, keep this all moving in the right direction. Yeah, I'll jump in there as well. I mean, we have been... You know, hearing a lot of stories in the news for the past two years since Russia invaded Ukraine that, look, the world wants to separate itself from, the Western world wants to separate from the supply coming out of Russia. Now, they control a lot of, you know, conversion and enrichment, and the Western world says, look, we have to get to that, but we can't do it overnight. So you can't see the, the U.S. government shutting off, you know, supply from Russia overnight. It takes a couple of years. So the U.S. is moving towards that. Arano, I had talks with them yesterday. They're working towards building their inventory to be able to take a bigger piece of that. And in Canada, look, we've got to make more discoveries and we've got to move those discoveries through the mines faster and get that supply into the market. And these things take time. You know, you, uh, the, the, the next mine coming online in Canada is probably going to be next gen zero. They discovered that almost 10 years, oh, just over 10 years ago. And here we are, they're probably not coming online for another five years. So these things take time. There's a lot of things you have to go through because nuclear is highly regulated. Uranium mining, nuclear regulations, they're, they're you know, but as difficult as it gets in the world, it takes time. I appreciate it. We're, uh, we're starting to run out of time here. So I want to close on uh, maybe a, a couple sentences from, from every participant on the stage. Uh, why is now a good time for retail investors to be looking at uranium equities? 
for if you want to kick us off? Yeah, I mean, I think we just uh, laid out the reason to be looking at the smaller market caps right now. I mean, the big guys have had moves. Uh, there's going to be a lot of torque to come into, as John said, you know, the smaller companies that are doing the right things, they're giving themselves, you know, the best probability to make that big next discovery uh, and have multiple chances at, at doing it like, like we both do. Um, but I think that's the time is now. All the catalysts are, are lining up on the supply demand side. And I think the confidence will come in, and, and when it does come, it moves fast. So you need to be, you know, in there and ready, you know, sort of before that happens, mm -hmm. because it's going to be something that you'll miss. Uh, if, if you blink, it's going to go. So it's going to be an exciting time. Uh, but I think that's why right now, and why in the junior space. Yeah, and I'll follow that up uh, on Drew's points. Like this is a remarkable time to be investing in uranium. I think everyone knows that's following the space that uranium is the hottest sector globally right now, and it's because people can see where we are today and where we're going over the next few years. There is not the the supply to keep up with the demand, so there's got to be the price has to continue to go forward, and there has to be money coming into the space for companies like ours to make discoveries. And then when you make a discovery in uranium space, it's a, you know, it can be a 10x or a 20x within a few years. So that is where the real big torque is, junior companies making discoveries. But I always caution my investors, look, mix out your portfolio, get a producer, get a developer, and then pick out a few exploration companies and really protect yourself that way. And hopefully you'll, uh, you'll, you'll pick one of the right companies. So the barriers to entry into this space are extremely high. You've got discovery time and cost, you've got technical issues, you've got regulatory issues. So uh, for new companies to come in, it's going to take a lot of time. So it's a great time to invest in well-established com uh, companies that have great properties that are in production because no one else is going to catch up with them very fast. So there's tremendous opportunity there. As the uh, price goes higher, uh, we should benefit from that quite well. And from my perspective, as we talked about a little earlier, think about the timelines here and its relation back to the fundamentals that we've, we've talked about today. And that this, I believe, is not a three-year you know, style of uptick and gone. As you start this nuclear build out, and it's already started, as you start this out, this is multi-decade. Multi-decade growth that once it starts, and we want to do this with all these lights, you know, with everything that's going on around us, nuclear is now ESG compliant. It's going to get built out on a global scale in all jurisdictions, and this is multi-decade, and it's going to take multi-decade response to find the fuel, get it into production, to get it into the utilities through the conversion process that is constrained. And that conversion process constraint will not be fixed in a short term. It's going to take some time. So there's risk there. So you've got a situation where you're going to have a lot of growth in all facets of the nuclear fuel cycle. And it's just going to be a real special super cycle in my view. Gentlemen, I appreciate you uh, joining us today. Uh, Thank you for sharing your insights and, and hope to see you back here in uh, 2025 when uranium has doubled in price again. <laughs>